You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Thank you, Dorothy. Have any of you met Mirabel Madrigal yet? Okay. If you have, then you know that she loves to sing and dance, and she's very supportive of her family, the family Madrigal. And you know what makes her extra special is that she is the only one in her family who is not that special. She doesn't have any special gifts. Mirabelle is also an animated character, but she's very much alive and real in the hearts of those of us who have come to know and love her in Disney's new movie, Encanto. This is not a Christian movie, this is not a faith-based movie, but there is this beautiful, albeit unintended parallel between that story and these words from Paul to the Corinthians. So I promise I won't give any movie spoilers, but out of curiosity again, how many of you have seen this movie? Excellent. Don't worry, we won't talk about Bruno. <laughs> the premise of Encanto is that every person in the Madrigal family has received a unique gift. Antonio communicates with animals. Isabella conjures up flowers that are almost as perfect as her own beauty. And Isabella has super, oh no, sorry, Luisa has super strength, just to name a few. You really should see the movie. Each person uses their gifts to benefit the family and to enrich their life together. But Mirabelle did not receive any unique gift. She didn't have any special powers or gifts of enchantment. She tries to put on a brave, very accepting face like everything is fine, as if it doesn't bother her. But of course it does. If only Mirabelle could sit with this letter to the Corinthians, perhaps she would be encouraged. Paul reminds us that God equips every faithful person. And boy, did Paul have a job on his hands. The city of Corinth was a large, bustling metropolis. 
And one commentator refers to Corinth as Sin City, not altogether different from how some people today might describe Las Vegas. There were all kinds of different cultures and religions and businesses were booming, but financial power was becoming more important to many people than living righteous lives. And that mentality had started to make its way into the church. In verse 4, as Dorothy just read for us, it says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In that ancient world, one's faith was not separate from their daily lives. It wasn't something they just interjected on occasion, infusing their commute to work, with example, with with a morning prayer and thinking, well, that was good enough, and then getting on with the tasks of their day. Now, we might see our secular or civic lives as being very separate from our church or religious lives, but they did not, and maybe we shouldn't either. They put Christ at the center of everything they did. So their spiritual gifts were not simply gifts they would use for their life in church community. Paul knew that they and we were called to use gifts in every facet of our lives. Paul's message is meant to be a wake-up call. God has gifted each person not solely for making your church a better place, but for the purpose of improving the entire kingdom. Paul's ministry was rooted in the belief that disciples of Christ work and live and serve together for the common good. And because his theology was deeply cynical of individualism, this text is also an invitation to see the gifts that others have to offer. I suppose that means we must consider gifts that others have and we do not. And that can be humbling. Just ask our friend Mirabel. Most of you receive our church's weekly e-letter detailing the many activities in our congregation. It's called This Week at WCUCC. And it's sent via email on Wednesday mornings. Our small team in the office works really hard to make sure that it's thorough. We want you all to be informed and up to date on the happenings. And two weeks ago, one of the articles in the newsletter announced the suspension of our in-person children's and youth ministry programs just temporarily during this uptick in COVID cases. I volunteered to write that article on behalf of the Board of Christian Education, who voted to suspend the programs uh, out of safety for our kids only the night before the email was to go out. So this is what I did. I created a simple graphic. I wrote the announcement. I inserted those two things into the newsletter, selecting our standard template. And then I scheduled the email to go out to all of you the very next morning. You know what I did not do? I did not proofread very well. You see, our standard template always inserts a header for us to customize for each article. It's a really obvious placeholder. It reads, heading here. (laughs) One would think it's a glaring reminder to the author to think of an appropriate headline, which I did not do. (laughs) That's the step I missed. So you all received an e-letter with several thoughtfully written articles, each one accompanied by an appropriate headline, except for the one I wrote that erroneously said, heading here. I opened my email on Wednesday morning and just quickly scanned it, thinking, great, it looks good. Oh, no. (laughs) I had that moment of realization that I made this horrible mistake, and I was mortified. The email was in my inbox which meant it was already in your inboxes, which meant it was too late to fix my mistake. And many of you might assume that Debbie Kellogg, our director of operations, writes the entirety of the e-letter, but I assure you, this mistake was all mine. So sorry, Debbie. (laughs) My favorite moment, though, was that morning when I went into Pastor Zigrid's office. I felt like I was entering confessional. (laughs) I've never been Catholic, but I imagine this is what it feels like. Embarrassed and sheepish, I said, Oh, Zigrid, I am sure by now you have noticed my big fat mistake, and I am so sorry. It's entirely my fault. I was working too fast and too late, and I'm really sorry. And Zigrid's response was, as you would expect, so very gracious. She said, Yes, I saw that. 
but I thought you were using heading as a verb, as in we're heading here. <laughs> Sigrid, I'm not sure if you were lying to me to make me feel better or if you really have that much confidence in me that you think I, that I uh, purposefully chose that headline, but thank you. <laughs> you have a gift for making people feel better when they goof. <laughs> and God has gifted me in some ways too, but not in every way, clearly. It turns out I'm not a trusted proofreader, and I should have asked for help. Now, to be fair, proofreading doesn't really count as a spiritual gift as defined by Paul. But this very public mistake is both a silly and a powerful reminder. We can't do ministry alone. We need each other. We need each other's gifts. None of us can do all the things or be all the things. That's not our job. That's God's job. That's what we hear in the psalm that Dorothy read for us this morning. All the ways that God is at work in the world, God can do all those things. God doesn't ask us to. And Paul knew this. He understood how the health of the church was dependent on the willingness of people to recognize their own gifts, to use the gifts for the glory of God and for the benefit of all, and to accept the blessing of others' spiritual gifts. For just a moment, I'd like you to turn your attention to this beautiful design cascading down from our communion table. Last week, we celebrated Baptism of Christ Sunday, and the Board of Worship did an absolutely spectacular job creating this tablescape for us for just that occasion, and I asked them to keep it up for this week also. Because that same Holy Spirit that descended upon Jesus when he was in the River Jordan that same Holy Spirit that we think of every time we remember our baptism, that same Holy Spirit that said, you are my beloved with whom I am well pleased, is the very Spirit that grants each of us unique abilities. It's the Spirit that powers the waters. It's the Spirit that powered Jesus' life and ministry, and it's the Spirit that powers each of us individually and our community. As we prepare to commemorate Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tomorrow, let us think about his giftedness for just a moment. A charismatic and compassionate leader of the civil rights movement, Dr. King was a skilled preacher. Of the spiritual gifts Paul lists in this letter, it is evident that God gifted Dr. King with wisdom and prophecy. As a follower of Christ, King did not work alone. His ministry and activism were all about building something that he called beloved community. Dr. King brought along people with him who had different gifts to propel the movement. Bayard Rustin, for example, was one of King's friends and advisors. With skills in nonviolent resistance and organizing, Rustin helped organize the Montgomery bus boycott and the 1963 March on Washington. Now, some might argue that getting 250,000 people to gather at the Lincoln Memorial in 1963 at the height of a racial reckoning in our country, a previous racial reckoning in our country, that maybe that was a little risky, they might say. Or we can look at it through the lens of the scripture, and that's when we realize that getting a quarter of a million people to gather peacefully in that climate and that day and age, gathered in the name of promoting love and justice and inclusion and equity, speaks to Rustin's gift of what Paul might call the working of miracles. We honor Dr. King and let us also honor those who selflessly served alongside him, sharing what they had and who they were for the good of the whole. Even if the beloved community King dreamed about is not yet fully realized, their good work and their gifts stay with us and continue to move us forward. In that spirit, our church has, for many years, arranged MLK Day service projects for youth and adults. And this pandemic has made it really hard for us to gather at some of the organizations where we have served in the past. So instead, Pastor Zigrid and I, along with the deacons, 
are encouraging all of you, members and friends of this congregation, to encourage, uh, uh, to bless another member or friend of this church with just a small act of service. In their email invitation to all of us, the deacons asked us to think about who might appreciate some simple, loving outreach. I have had the joy of hearing from many of you who have said yes to this invitation. Now, you have shared your plans for MLK, service, MLK Day of Service with me, and you know what I'm witnessing. I am witnessing how you have decided to use your actual spiritual gifts to build up this community. Those who have said you plan to send a card or a meal to someone who is hurting, and to the person in this congregation who said, I don't want to help just one person, I want to help many, so I'm donating blood in honor of MLK. To all of you, I affirm your gifts for healing. To those who have decided to share in the ministry of presence, sitting with someone else in this congregation sometime in the next week, with a deep abiding knowledge that Christ is with you, I affirm your gift of faith. To those who will call a friend and remind them, they are and will always be loved, and God will walk with them in whatever comes next, I affirm your gift of prophecy. And with all of our gifts brought together, we are a stronger community of faith. As it was done in the ancient world, though, let's use our giftedness not just for the benefit of this church community, but for the whole of the world. Yesterday's crisis in Colleyville, Texas, is a poignant reminder of how critical it is that we all give what we have to offer for the common good. You have probably heard, as Pastor Zigrid mentioned in her prayers, about the four hostages that were held captive in a synagogue, including one rabbi. And thanks be to God, they have all been released, and those four hostages are now safe. It has me thinking, which of our gifts can we offer in collaboration with the gifts of our friends of other faiths and the friends of no faith to ensure a safer world? How can we give of ourselves for the glory of God and serving all of God's people? This brings us back to our friend, Mirabel Madrigal. I'm really hesitant to take a Disney analogy too far in a sermon. There feels like there's some danger in that. It's not really fair to compare ourselves to Mirabelle anyway. We can't all have Lin-Manuel Miranda writing the soundtrack to our lives. So I'll offer what my friend, Reverend Shannon Trenton, said when she and I were reflecting on this movie together. She said, when we are tempted to compare our, ourselves to others as Mirabelle does, we can lean on God's power and love to remind us that what we are given is good and who we are is enough. Let's stop kicking ourselves for the things we cannot do and give thanks for the abilities God has given us. The life-giving message in Paul's letter comes from verse 7. Hear these words again. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The manifestation of the Spirit our gifts are of God. The vast power and God's vast power and love is revealed through us and through our gifts and how we use them. We see even more of God when we empower others to be themselves and to use their spirit-given abilities too. And we follow in the way of Christ when we allow others to use their gifts to help us even if it's just for proofreading? Have we fulfilled Paul's vision in building the ideal church or a fully collaborative world? Maybe not. But I am faithful that when we all work together, we will be heading here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>